microphone test. Uh, let's hear the bard. <laughs> if there be nothing new, but that had been before, how are our brains beguiled, which, laboring for invention, bear amiss the second burden of a former child? Oh, that record could, with a backward look, of even 500 courses of the sun, show me your image in some antique book, since mine at first and character was done. That I might see what the old world could say to this composed wonder of your frame, where we're mended, or where better they, or where the revolution be the same. Oh, sure I am. The, white, the wits of former days to subjects worse have given admiring praise. Bravo! Bravo, Edward! Submit your card to the bard with one beguiled brain. <laughs> Braided uh, with a modern top. Well, fortnight in Weston, and I'll turn your sonnet into a dime. One line at a time. <laughs> and a dime at every juice joint. From the bard to the dar. If music be the food of love, play on with a bottle of absinthe and a harlot of a saw. <laughs> Delightfully. The bard is wondering if the new style outshines the old. He wishes he could call on an ancient poet to describe the image of his love. Claims the master writers of the past have surely praised lesser subjects than she. The one before him, the one he writes to, Scare them tonight. With care. Et voilà stop. What is that? So scared you shit in your seat. Be afraid. En français, it means to have your chips. In roulette, it's the fear of losing everything, and in the honoring the fleeting excitement of the gamble, that moment when the croupier throws the ball and you pass the point of returning. Laurent taught me the phrase. He had it tattooed on his arm after surviving the battle at Verdun, where 1,400 cannons fired at him across an eight-mile line of defense, 100,000 shells per hour, at Wallach indeed. Laurence, your, uh, your suitor whom you met only last month. No, Laurence, the war hero who survived Verdun. Okay, a war le, le Jock. Follow it. The source of war. Regulated. Sculpted into story. Remember, with controlled voices and fired up. The first act, played more indignant? Yeah, uh, overflowing with bitterness. Ah! Ah! Yes, <laughs> that's it. Five, four, three, two. A wide-eyed welcome to all manner of guests on this warm evening. I am Martin Tremble, and I am here tonight with Mary Stone Park and Edward Vanderbeek. And we offer your beguiled minds safe passage through the ether tonight, whilst strolling with us on Knickerbocker Avenue. Strange Science and Terror Radio Pro. With production executed here at WKNIX Studios and funded from the MPPNR Company. Tonight, we pull from very low into the depths three tales which are not to be dismissed as folk nonsense. My listeners, Please understand that the stories we bring you lay at the crux of the human mind. Behold, split or shattered. The gods do not deign to speak to us. Therefore, we clasp and scratch at the sky itself with our cracked hands and overcome with pain we we translate the secrets of the night so sit close to your loved ones pay heed to the spirits among us and listen carefully for the secret poem of the heaven
It is June, 1920. The Great War is over. And never again will humanity suffer the fate of such disaster. It is a sentiment I wish I believed. My friends, in 100 years from now, will we still be at each other's throats with the dull blade of hatred? Yes, indeed, we will be. The subject of our first tale is the monster to be feared most. We bring you the story of Hannah Dalton. A volcanologist who has a chance encounter with a horrible beast. Professor Dalton, I presume? You! You must be he. Madison Harlow, at your service, sire. Well, sit, sit. You have quite the night facilities here. We are funded by Her Royal Majesty's Scientific Endeavor. We've been doing geologic research assisted by the Dutch in this building for 15 years. Although I've spent the better part of 30 years pulling strings and developing favor. Would you like a drink? Please. Stiff. Why exactly have you sent for me, Professor? As you might have heard, the volcano Clute has been foreshadowing an eruption. The town is currently being evacuated and the scientific community is fleeing for safe ground. I and my assistants are the only ones left here since the call to leave was announced. It, it, it has to do with my daughter. You see, there is another facility we had built up near the volcanic rim. Hana graduated from her geology studies four months before its completion and started her volcanic research project four years ago. She was the brightest of the class and showed a disproportionate amount of talent in her field. Managing a quartered crew of 25, she, she developed a new method for surveying geologic activity. I was, uh, I, I am very proud. Yes. Yes, I see that. Go on. Twelve days ago, some of our scientists arrived here on the last planned evacuation caravan down the mountain. And to our heartbreak, Hannah and twelve of her colleagues remained on the mountain. Our chief science officer brought word that Hannah has uh, developed her own theory. He says that she insists the volcano will not erupt in the sense we understand, but that, that a great demon will use it as a doorway to enter our world. A demon? Apparently half of the research team believe her and have stayed behind, following her into this madness. Disregarding her scientific purpose, she has digressed to the status of an end-of-times prophet. She has formed a goddamn cult. As the last caravan was departing, she and those at her side were seen setting small fires around the perimeter of the facility. She has endangered all of their lives. If our benefactors find out about this, we will lose all that we have built. She seems welcome to such an event. She's dangerous? Uh, to herself, yes, I believe so, and, and possibly to others. More whiskey, please. I need you, Mr. Harlow, to travel to the summit of the volcano and bring Hannah back to me. You are my only candidate now, due to the possibility of, uh, eruption. <laughs> you come highly recommended by our benefactors due to your previous 
war history, your commended fearlessness, and your, and most particularly, your debt to my financiers. But please, Mr. Hollow, hike to the rim and bring back my daughter. If you make it there and back, your, your debt will be erased. If Hannah is with you, I will personally compensate you very well in addition. Benefactors. TGP? It's my daughter, Addison. And how much time do I have? Impossible to know. Let me get this right. She believes a demon will come out of the volcano as it erupts. And TGP is a vested interest? Well, I'll accept the test. Oh, thank you, Mr. Hollow. We have uh, provisions packed and ready for you. You will need to take this audio recording machine. I've recorded a message for Hannah. Perhaps if she hears my voice, she will know I sent you and, and trust you enough to return with you. This reel is marked with her name. The others are blank and will allow you to record field notes along your way. On your return, I expect to see Hannah with you. Or, uh, evidence that you made it to the summit along with audio descriptions of your venture. When do I leave? First light. You will need a good rest. And there is another detail. <laughs> yes. I would presume so. The demon. A local myth. <laughs> a legend that describes a god of fire rising from the stomach of the earth. It is said that the sky will come, become black with ash and all life will be snuffed out by the great demon called Kex. It has long been interpreted by anthropologists in the region to be a, a, a primitive explanation of volcanic activity. A wondrous legend with a seed of truth. This is somehow the wool that has been pulled over my dear Hannah's eyes. And as a man of science, I cannot bear the thought of losing her to such rubbish place. 25,000 quid. Passage back to London when the task's complete. Agreed. My assistant will show you to your accommodations and see you off in the morning. Mm. Well, very well. Day one. I'm two days' walk from Hannah Dalton's research laboratory. I've been provided a pack containing a wool blanket, full canteen, six days' rations, bread and beans, Small lantern, paper with writing implement, and audio recording machine. This fiery mount. There was a lake at the base of the volcano. It's recently drained due to unease of earth. Steam vents scatter my path. Purged from the earth like ghosts escaping hell. The heat's dry. It's such that breathing itself is a strain. No animals present, neither a single busy insect or a belly crawler, or even one shrill bird song exists here. There's only gas, and peril, and heat. The boiling and noxious odors carry past me down to the village below. I, I made a camp after wondering what awaits me. Day two. The stench of sulfur is harsh upon me. The stones below my feet seem as rotten eggs grinding into the earth. It's almost unbearable. My face is kerchiefed, making it even harder to breathe. I know that by dusk today I'll reach Hannah. And for the first time, I'm a bit nervous about this encounter. I'm also experiencing lightheadedness and exhaustion. Yesterday was a grueling march and I, I rose with a headache this morning after waking up choking on the fumes through the night. How could she remain here? Will she be unscathed after remaining so directly exposed to Clute? Professor Dalton? I'll attempt to collect your daughter tonight. And hopefully, we'll both be fleeing the jelly mouth by morning. Day two, evening. I can now see the laboratory. The Union Jack is still flying, but it's at half-mast. It's either a distress signal or a death. There's a, a 
plume of smoke rising from the western side of the building. The main entrance on the eastern side facing me, it looks abandoned. There's no movement other than smoke. I've, I've run through most of the water and half my rations. This tape recorder, it's, it's been working well and I'm soon to use it to share your message with Hen. If for some reason, and I fail to return, I expect my debt to TGP to be erased. Even so. Hannah Dalton! Hello? Hannah Dalton? Can you hear me? I'm inside of the facility now. It's quite hot, and there seems to have been a fire in here that's still smoldering from the offices. There's bits of char and broken glass everywhere, and ashen letters cluster the walls. I can't make sense of them. I'm, I'm walking through to the rear labs now. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus Christ. There's, there's a tangled pile of bodies just stacked and burnt and blackened. It's horrible. Ungodly. The skin is... The skin is charred and pulled tight to their skull. Their teeth are all exposed as if they're grimace. Some body parts lay strewn... Lay strewn across the floor. The reason you huh. are here on your knees before me has to do with three letters. T. G. P. You are undoubtedly the lowly dog my father sent to fetch me. Loyal though you may be, you lack the ability to understand what's happening here. Hannah, please. My name is Addison, and I don't have to understand. All I have to do is to get you out of here safely. Please, I have a message from your father. Listen. <clears throat> my dear Hannah, if you're hearing this message, then the, the day of the dragon is upon us. I believe you. I believe them. But Hannah, you have no idea what they are capable of. They cannot release the beast without you. I beg of you, with all of my tears, to abandon the plan and come back to me. If you release that monster, the world will forever change. It will no longer be habitable by humans. All manner of death will succeed where life once flourished. TGP plans to set loose the demon, but they fail to realize that there is no way to control it once released. You must abandon their plight or we will all be stamped out by the violent beast. It no longer makes sense to aid them in their deranged plan now that we know what destructive forces they wield. I humbly beg of you, my dear. Please come back to me. Close the gateway. Save us all. I have entrusted this man Addison with your life. In fact, all of our lives. You must return with him now. <laughs> My father, the original sinner, the very man conscripted by TGP to carry out this madness. The great benevolent one awaits us and you bring me the trappings of a fool? Tell me, Addison, do you really know who you work for? Do you know TGP? Yes, the Tactical Geological Partnership. It's a corporation. Stems from the League of Nations. I was drafted by them as a surveyor in my youth. And drafted for what? 28 years of military tactics and predictions. Then upgraded to classified ghost operations. A hired gun? A promise keeper? A would-be ghost? Hannah. Hannah, tell me. Did you... Did you kill these people? Have you lit these fires? What is this beast your father mentions? He claimed not to believe in it. What, what is happening here? Down in the village, there's a local myth. A demon god of fire, Kex. They believe that from the center of the earth will rise a great dragon demigod who will sound out all of life on earth. Covered in molten rock and flame and the dragon breathes smoke and holds within its belly a pure hatred of humans. It flies on soot-covered wings. Its heart to said, its heart is a forge of rock and metal foot of fire capable of melting everything. Kex will rise and demand the total destruction of the planet. 
I devoted my life to the pursuit of truth, only to find out that it does not exist outside of death. TGP is an acronym for Titan God Project. It is a secret long-term conspiracy that has been planned for decades. The current rulers of Earth have let their powers decline. They believe that through violence and manipulation they can reinforce their position. They plan to restructure society. Which society? All society! Once the transition happens, no human will ever challenge them again! They plan to devastate the masses by unleashing Kex. Now that I have found him, they think themselves to be protected in their underground def defensible cities that have been building for years! The surface of the earth will be trodden under the claws of the, of the demon and, and his breath will burn all who stay above ground. It is said in the legend that once a great deal of time has passed, Kex will return to the volcano and will become obsolete. The world will be green again. The trustees of TGP plan to reemerge after years of chaos and terror with their technologies intact in order to forge a new world with a clean slate placed at their feet. If this is true, then why do you help them? Do you bend to their will, calling on destruction? I box their ears and baffle their minds! Hannah, this is terrible. Let's not hear the voice of the beast or cower below a shadow. Come back with me to your father. But we haven't much time. We have no time! You see, I know my father is correct when he says his message about Kex. That he can't be controlled. I believe it's true. It also happens to be the same reason why I have engaged the final ritual and initiated the release of the dragon. Before I die, I will see him with my own eyes. And in dying, I will know he will reign over the earth for long after TGP have run out of water and wheat in their petty little tombs. You see, they haven't seen all of my arithmetic. As it begins, so it ends. Join me outside to see the face of Kex. Follow me to the rim. I want to see him rise. Wait, Hannah, no! The ground shakes below me. Hannah's told me the secret of Kex, and now she runs to the volcanic rim to greet the beast of destruction. I believe Clute is near eruption. The ground is it's splitting in places, and steam escapes the mighty pit. I can hear an epic bellowing coming from within the earth. And there are sounds of sirens. They're coming from the laboratory. I can no longer see Hannah. The rim of the volcano is crumbling as the beast awakens. It's emerging now through magma and smoke with a slow-tempered rise from the earth. I can make out its great neck. It has spikes running down its back which seem to be tagged with great beacons. And as it ascends, I can see that the great dragon is... It's actually inanimate. The howling alarms and the burning volcano blend into the sound of the launch mechanics inside the mountain. I can see the full body of the rocket now. It's, it's lifting into the sky. It leaves a black smoke tail behind it. <clears throat> As it rises high, <clears throat> it's higher now. <clears throat> it drops its wings and claws to the ground. <clears throat> it ignites. I can feel the heat from the first shockwave! Hinaka! Ah! Hallowed ground, molten dreams. No time for panic. The sense is too slow. 500 billion pounds of flesh. Char. You see, my dear listeners, monsters do exist. It was a winged fire demon that scorched the earth clean. A global bomb launched from a demon legend. A grand and mythical endeavor allowed our forebears a clean slate. In fact, years later, our ancestors stepped out of their caverns and into the Garden of Eden and began rep 
repopulating the Earth once more. To claim the truth is to call someone else a liar. A river will cut the Earth in half if given the time to do so. A moniker can alter one's conscience. And a single announcement from the news can enslave the minds of millions. Our second testament tonight takes place in a small town in Missouri on the last day of Tom Ryle's life. A World's Report now. I'm Preston Michaels. Today is December 3rd, 1920. The president is traveling east this morning toward an economic consortium in Massachusetts, which has the potential to ban controversial practices on Wall Street. The investment world awaits their conclusions. The field of agriculture has lately erupted into debate over soil stripping. Local prairie farmers claim diminishing yields as the salt of the earth gravely accumulates in the damaged soil. In science news, there will be a great astronomical show tonight as a large comet will continue its pass by the Earth, reaching the closest it's been to Earth in over 100 years. Due to the synchronicity with tonight's total lunar eclipse, the comet has been named Artemis after the goddess who reigns over the moon. It will be viewable from throughout the Midwest. Artemis, Artemis is composed mostly of ice and carbon, but scientists theorize it also contains parts of iron, nickel, silver, and platinum in smaller amounts due to the extreme bright blueness of the comet's dusty tail. In local news, police have identified three more bodies linked to the ghastly midnight slasher murders, bringing the total number of victims to 12 within the last two months. The federal government has issued a $500 reward for any information leading to the arrest of the murderer. Rebecca Felding joins us now to report on the state of the local miners' union. I quote, it's high time for change around here, and we're going to make sure that happens. Dean Wallace, Douglas County Mine Worker. Since the end of the Great War in 1918, local mine workers have tripled statewide. Six discontinued mines in the state have been reopened, and the post-war industry has incorporated the new methods and technologies produced during the war. There has been a resurgence in many types of... All right. All right, everyone, freeze. Freeze, you stay right where you are, honey. Why don't you say another word? You, Will Rogers. You get down on the floor, you stay there. Please, don't hurt Shut enough. up. I said, say another word, I'll shoot you dead right here, you understand? <laughs> Old time, you know how to work this transmission? <laughs> yeah, I can. Right, then you get up, you stay here, and make sure we stay live on the broadcast radio. And if you stop transmitting, I'll put a bullet right through your heart, you understand? Uh, uh, yeah, oh, oh God, I believe you, okay, all right. All right can they hear me? <laughs> yes. Well, good. Good. Because tonight your listeners are going to get some truth for once. Miss, I want you to sit in your chair, and I want you to interview me. Get up and sit in your chair, and you interview me right in front of the microphone. You're going to get a gold medallion from Mr. Pulitzer after this. Yes, yes, all right. <laughs> what should I say? Well, you could start by asking me my name. <laughs> Who are you? What do you want? I'm here to tell my story, my confession, my final night on this planet. It's going to be witnessed by you. Now, my name is Tom Ryle, and I'm the Midnight Slasher. <laughs> Silence! I haven't the time. Next question, miss. Why are you doing this? Listen, listen to me, all of you. I want to explain that my confession is full of remorse for my victims. I should have never happened. It'll be a challenge to explain. People are going to find it hard to believe. I am the son of a cosmic writer. And I was put here on Earth by the commander herself. And she's known as the guidepost. And she's the one responsible for all the terraforming here in this part of the galaxy. Oh, no. You're insane! A madman killer living out of fantasy! If you run for that door... <laughs> if you run for that door again... Happening. This isn't happening. 
I cannot be any more serious than I am at this moment. Now get back in your chair. Get back in your chair. And I'm going to tie you two down, and we're going to finish this. It's a proper interview, okay? There. Now, open your ears, or this planet will change. Now, the cosmic riders travel on, on gigantic gigantic asteroids and comets and they travel through the universe exploring and searching for resources and when they find them they develop them. now if a writer finds a planet that has regenerating life on it then the development becomes a matter of cohabitation and the writer must touch the soil of the planet and place a sea child before continuing on interjection miss you claim that you travel through outer space and you're here brandishing a weapon and threatening to kill us. Why are you doing this to us? Ask me to explain. <laughs> oh my God. Can, you, can you explain to our listeners who exactly you are and what do you mean by sea child? A sea child, a sea child, a sea child. It's placed on a planet by its parent, the Cosmic Rider, and as it grows, it'll absorb and possess the order knowledge of all the animals encountered on that planet. And then on a future pass, the Rider returns, and it collects the Sea Child, who's by then versed in all the knowledge and the terrain and the blood code of all the life on the planet. Now you must understand, we collect life throughout the universe. And a Sea Child can inhabit a planet, but only when the gravitation of the planet aligns in such a manner with its star as it is tonight. Now here on Earth, you call it a full moon. I was a sea child on this planet 138 years ago when the, the common Artemis last visited. When the common Artemis visited, and tonight she's gonna return to collect me. And with I go the secrets of the Earth. Please. Please let us go. We have nothing to do with this. No, not until I complete my document. It's a testament to Earth. No one will leave. Humans must know the truth. If this is true, then why did you kill all of those people? Rebecca, no, hush. Don't tell it. Just, and so just finishing ask. my story, you will have your answer to that question. What time is it? What? What time is it? Half past eight. Well, it's going to begin soon. What with? The lunar eclipse. When a sea child's placed on life-bearing planet, he arrives through electromagnetism. It's formed the moment he touches down, the gravitation of the full moon allows transients to happen. So you came to Earth on a comet? Precisely. precisely. 138 years ago tonight. And why in God's name did you kill all of those innocent people? I'm a livid, living, vivid system. I'm designed to collect the code of life. I'm a sea child. And so being, I suffer the curse of entropy. And where I go, death follows. I collect life, and my life will be collected. My curse can only be lifted when I leave this world, and its secrets lay exposed to the riders. Entropy? If you are cursed, why? Why us? Can't you just leave us alone? When a sea child is placed through gravitational light on a planet, it pays a great toll. And my destiny was to rise up through the forms of this planet, embodying each until I reached the highest form of consciousness existing on Earth. The form of human. Tom, please. Whoever. It's known among riders that the very first life form a sea child encounters begins and becomes its base form, its fundamental vehicle of life. And herein lies the curse. Yeah. What curse? Every time. Every time the Earth's lunar gravitational field recurs in magnitude exactly as it was when I arrived. Sea child. Tom Ryle. He degenerates back into its back into its base form. And, and what and what animal is it? Was it a canis lupus? You call it a, a gray wolf. Oh. <clears throat> I've, I've bonded, bonded with, with the blood of all mammals on Earth. I was, was placed to, to accumulate the blood coat 
all the sentient beings on this planet. And now, the commander, the commander who chance to collect me, she will kill me. The guy post has arrived. The humans are on all their charge. December 4th, 1920. We here at MLLC Radio Company have personally witnessed something remarkable. The world will never be the same after experiencing first-hand cosmic events last night, when for the first time in modern history, a man was witnessed transforming before our very eyes and ears into a monstrous animal. Scientists scrambled to reach a theory that would explain these events. After suffering a complete hostage ordeal and being tied up by a madman, Rebecca Felding was forced to witness the murder of her colleague Preston Michaels at the hands of the beast, live on the air. One day later, she is being held and interviewed in recovery at St. Harold's Hospital. In sorting out the facts about the case, the Federal Bureau of Investigation has announced this morning that the small explosion and death of Tom Ryle was indeed caused by a meteorite. The hard metal object was reported to be composed of iron and silver. We expect more information in the coming weeks. This astounding event has blown wide the doors of scientific solidarity as biologists worldwide debate lycanthropy and alien life. 
And now, Jillian Cameron with a special economic report. A state united we must remain. Milton Jennings, Monroe County Farmer. In Summer Ranch, the governor proposed a stopgap solution regarding the water shortage. The opposition trails with short run plans to relieve the pangs of drought surrounding the counties of the farmers. <laughs> The curse which Tom Ryle was subject to was that of servitude. His last testament was a gift to us here on Earth. For now we have knowledge of our own planetary fate. And with that knowledge, 138 years to prepare for Artemis to return with her legion of cosmic Writers, are they destined to reform this planet as they deem fit? And what of the mysterious man-wolf stories we've heard over the last century do we believe? Our world is filled to the sky with mysterious, unexplained events. In 1858, a single ghost visited every human on Earth. 1880, a group of British scientists discovered a colony of giant iguanas living on an uncharted island off the coast of Japan. 1902, our Navy's first submarine called the USSS Plunger dove deep into the ocean and encountered a door through time. <sighs> and in 1909, two young lovers slipped into quicksand only to end up weightless at the center of the earth. Yes, dear listener, the idea that we command our planet and understand who we are is an illusion. We bear the testament of these stories with the intention to open your eyes to the truth that we are all deeply dreaming. Picture a large white room. The lights are harsh and bright. There is a young woman sitting on the floor which is graded with white metal. Suddenly, a large amount of water splashes into the room and immediately drains through the floor, leaving compact mineral deposits scattered around the woman's feet. Alia Sarah leans over and picks one of them up, taking a bite from it. My name is Alia. I'm not quite sure how long I've been here. Long enough to discover after nearly starving, the water is safe to drink and brings food with it. I believe it flows into the room every day, although I have no idea how long a day is anymore. There is no sun or darkness here, no window to see outside, just this horribly bright tall room with unreachable sky above me. I do remember how I got here. It all started one evening back home when my brother Dovine started calling my name. Alia! 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 Well, there you are, Alia. Come with me. We're gonna go through the forest. I want to find some berries. Bring your satchel. No, baby, we shouldn't. It's too late, and Mother will not allow it. Oh, don't be a baby. We'll be back before the sun sets. She won't even know. And when we bring berries back, it'll make her happy. Come on, it won't take long. Do you know where to find them? I think so. <laughs> you love Lana berries? Let's go, then. Come on, short one. One who listens to worms. Only if you don't call me names while we're gone. Agreed. One who listens to rocks. One who eats bugs. The sign the one who speaks through her ears. Leave it quiet, you promised! All right, my little salamander. I'll stop. We shouldn't be too much further from the creek where we can find the fauna berries. 
Do you hear that, Doveen? It's a dog! I do. It must be in the direction that we're heading. I think it's getting louder. It sounds like it's in trouble. We should help it. It could be dangerous. Let's go this way, around it. Walk to the creek. Listen, Doveen. Doesn't it sound like it's in pain? It's in trouble. It won't stop. Please, let's go see it. Yeah, you might be right. Come on. Maybe, maybe it's stuck in a trap. Here, let's go this way. If it's nice, can we take it home with us? Look, look, do you see it? It's a hound, something's wrong. It's howling over that bush. Here, let's get a closer look. Look, Doveen! There are puppies under the bush there! It's okay, girl. Come here, we'll help. She likes you, Dove. You look to the puppies. There are three of them, with cute little noses. They feel cold, but they're moving. Collect them in your satchel, but carefully. Oh, yes. And we will save them and bring them back to Mother. I love them. They're so sweet, Dove. I will name you Vedra. And we'll care for your babies. Do you trust us, Vedra? <laughs> <laughs> Doveen! She knows to trust us. Uh -huh. Let's go home. Uh-huh, come on. <laughs> We've been gone for so long. Mother and Father will be angry. I'm coming back after the sun has set. It's okay, El. Once they hear that we rescued the animals, they'll be happy and proud of us. The entire village will think us heroes. Look how beautiful the puppies are. Keep walking. One who walks with dogs. The puppy dreamer. One who is a hero to hounds. You're not funny. These puppies are special. Watch your step. Come on. Yes, yes. Let's get back to... Wait. Dovee. Do you see that there? See what? That. There. Look. Yeah. What is that? Let's take a look. It looks like a tower. It's getting dark. If it weren't for the moon, you couldn't see it. it looks like a staircase. Yeah. It's a path upward. Look, Elia, you can't see the top of it. It just it just fades into the night sky. I can see the outline of it from the moonlight. It looks like it goes on forever. It must be the world's tallest tower. Or a pathway to the home of the gods. It's okay, it's just a staircase. Let's see where it leads. Maybe it'll take us to a chamber of treasures. I don't know. Come on, one is afraid of nothing. Pedro doesn't like it. She's a dog. She's not able to comprehend the presence of the gods or treasures. Let's just go up a short way. And if we can find out where it goes. Okay. Pedro, stay here and wait for us. It won't be long. Look, Ilya. The steps are made of some kind of pitch black rock. It shines in the moonlight. I cannot make out separate stones. It seems to be one large piece called from a quarry, but from where? There's no other stone formations around here. Not that look like this. Let's go up. It feels cold. Colder than the night is now. Oh, we nearly forgot. I had the puppies in the satchel. Maybe I should leave them with Vedra? Don't just bring them. We won't be gone long. Come on, little ones. Okay, Dove. It's okay, 
puppies. I'll protect you. Come on. He who jumps into the rivers without knowing how deep they are. Do you see the light now? Perhaps it comes from the top of the tower. Ilya. You look... You look hollow. Are my eyes tricking me? I can see right through you. You're changing too! You're getting smaller! Domine! You're shrinking! No! No! Domine! I... Where are you? Can you hear me? No! What? What's happening? It's the top of the tower! Mom, are you with me? I must reach the end of it! Domine! the feeling of great pressure all over my body, like, like when you dive underwater. When I awoke, I was in this giant white cell here with its grated metal floors and the blinding bright open space above me. My brother and the puppies were gone. I was alone. Taunted by the blurred vision and sound of the gods above me. There were giants filling up the whole sky above my cell. I can hear them echoing and booming as if they're trying to talk to me. They waver from side to side and sometimes leave from the sky like fast-moving clouds. Every day, a large metallic tube has been lowered down from the light above me and floods the room with a single droplet of water. The most I can conceive is that they're giant shamans who have brought me to another planet. They have taken me from my family, trapped me here, and they sustain me, keeping me alive in a blurred dream, a fantasy. And now my mind, lost of all measure, every fleeting moment is without promise. Perhaps I've got it. So as time continues to lapse, I tell my story out loud. I must remind myself of my family and who I am. I have to remember who I am. Congratulations, Dr. Johnson. The Quantum Staircase project is a complete success and we've been granted an indefinite extension and full funding. This discovery is completely fascinating. How are the samples? The samples are stable, Doctor. We find more every day. Thank you for coming to the lab on this monumental occasion. We are a go for the quantum expansion of sample D183, and the process is just about complete. Please, uh, follow me to the staging area. Excellent. I can't wait to see, this, see the results. Dr. Fuller, Dr. Jensen. It gives my department and I great satisfaction to have you here with us to witness the quantum expansion of subject D183 for hyperquantum staircase project 1587. Please, please, please. Let's step up to the incubation chamber. Oh, it's absolutely stunning. Three puppy hound dogs. The living, breathing, amazing. We've already named them Galileo, Copernicus, and Ptolemy. Outstanding. <laughs> in honor to our forebears. This is by far the most significant scientific discovery in history. Well done. Congratulations. With this method, I believe we can solve a host of Earth's societal problems. Cheers. Cheers to you all. The secrets of the natural world. The codes that long to be cracked. The fruit of the tree of knowledge. Perhaps Aelia and Devine have again been united here among us. Enlarged and emboldened by several factors of ten. You see, the planet you stand on is home to many unfathomable creatures who keep in the shadows and under the puddles. 
the very space in front of us folds up into alternate realities. One must move with a clever foot. And the great burning sun overhead is always blasting, cursing, chomping at the bit, tempting the earth to fall into flame, slowly making its explosive way to our homes where we sleep. Join us for our next broadcast as we gaze into the mind of a heretic who meets his fate. Hear the story of Gordon Grimm, the lion tamer who went mad as a hatter, and witness true terror at the hands of the Glacier Lake Witch. This has been Knickerbocker Avenue Strange Science and Terror Radio Program. Brought to you from WKNIX Studios and featuring the talent of Mary Stone Park as Hannah Dalton, Rebecca Felding, Newswoman 2, Alia, and Dr. Ford. Edward Vanderbeek as Addison Harlow, Tom Ryle, Devine, and Dr. Fuller. And I, your loyal host and narrator, Martin Tremble. Reading for Professor Dalton, Preston Michaels, Newsman 2, and Dr. Jensen. May you never find yourself lost among dreams, or without a harrowing thought. Good night to you.